Hardbit FM and you're tuned to His Art and that is every Friday between 8 and 10. And every Friday, as I say, I come to radio and I really ask the Lord, what should I share? A lot of times the Lord gives me a message a day or two before radio and sometimes He gives me a message the morning of the radio show. And this morning as I was praying and asking the Lord, I saw this Shunammite woman running for her miracle. And today's message is called Keep Running. Keep Running. And this is what the message is based upon. It's the prophet Elisha comes to a city and this Shunammite woman starts giving him food. She just reaches out to this prophet, this man of God. And then after a while she says to her husband, listen, let's make a room for this man. And you can read the story in 2 Kings 4 verse 8 to 37. One day Elijah went to Shunem and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there and he ate. She said to her husband, I know this man is a man of God and he often comes to the city. He is a holy man. Let us make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed, a table, a chair, a lamp. Then he stayed there whenever he came to the city. So this woman really reaches out and she says, I want to bless this man of God. I want to be a blessing. So then when Elijah came, he actually sent his servant to ask the woman, what can be done for you? And Elijah says in verse 13, you have done such a lot for us. What can be done for you? Can we speak on behalf to the king or the commander of the army? So the prophet is willing to actually go to the authorities and speak on her behalf. She replied and she said, I have a home among my people. And that's all she says. She doesn't ask him for anything. She doesn't request anything. So then Elijah asked, he says, what can be done for this woman? And Gehazi said, she has no son and her husband is old. Then Elijah said, call her. So he called her and stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elijah said, you will have a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant and the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elijah had told her. Look at this woman's response. She gives the prophet food. She looks after the prophet. She gives him a room with all the furnishings in the room. She's promised the son and she says, no, don't mislead me. But then in spite of her lack of faith or belief, she received the son as the man of God prophesied. And in verse 18, it says the child grew up and one day he went to, out to his father, who was with the reapers. And he said, My father, my father, my head, my head. His father told a servant, Carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. So this woman sits with her son on her lap until noon, and then the boy died. She went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God and then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, Please send me one of my servants and the donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today? He asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you to. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. Now, this woman reacts in a certain way when crisis hits. And this really spoke to my heart and ministered. And I know there's so many people that are going through difficult things. This woman had done everything right. She had given the man of God food. She had provided for him a place to stay. Even when he asked her, what can I do for you? She didn't give him a long list, so she had no sub motives. And when his son had come home sick, 
she had sat with this boy on her lap until noon. When the sun had passed away, she didn't go and start crying and screaming and panicking. She took the boy, she laid him on the man of God's bed and she shut the door. And then she saddled her donkey and she started going. Her husband still tried to deter her. Why are you doing this? She said, listen, I'm just doing this. And even as she's on her way to the man of God, when he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is the child all right? And she answered, everything is all right. She doesn't stop to discuss anything even with the servant. In verse 27, when she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord had hidden it from me and has not told me why. This is quite interesting because a lot of times we expect that the answers are going to come from the prophets and the men of God. But here, this woman is persistently pushing towards a miracle. She is running and she's not allowing anything to stop her. You see, when you're a Christian for a certain period of time, you start seeing that things can sometimes go wrong in your life. That you can go through difficult seasons or through times when you don't even understand what is going on. This woman was doing everything right. She provided for this man of God. She facilitated the work of God in that area. And yet, even after receiving this miracle, a terrible thing happened to her. And not even the prophet was aware of what was happening. But this unnamed Shunammite woman, we don't know her name today, but she teaches us something in our situation as we look at our lives and we look at what we are going through. She teaches us something, and that is to keep running, to keep running, to not stop running, to not stop pursuing that miracle, to carry on with what God has started in our lives. And even when we get to a situation where we look at it and we say to ourselves, listen, we don't know what's going on here. We don't know why this boy died. She didn't call the mourners. She didn't arrange the funeral. She took that little boy. She put him on the man of God's bed. She closed the door. She saddled the donkey and she ran towards the man of God. She did not stop. She was not deterred by her husband, not by the servant. She just continued on. And even when the man of God said to his servant, listen, take my staff and go put it on the boy's face. She was not satisfied with that response. She said to him, listen, I'm not leaving. And then he had to actually follow her. It's interesting when you see that. And sometimes you can miss that little detail. It says in verse 31, Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face. But there was no sound and no response. So Gehazi went back to Elisha and told him the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on the couch. He went in, he shut the door on the two of them, and he prayed to the Lord. Then he got up on the bed, and he laid on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And he stretched himself out on the boy. And then in verse 35, Elijah turned away and walked back and forth in the room, and then got on the bed and stretched out Himself once more, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. And then Elisha gave the boy back to his mother. Even this miracle doesn't come easily. The prophet says, the Lord had hidden it from me. I don't know what's going on here. Take the staff, put it on his face. But even then, the Lord doesn't do a miracle. Nothing happens. The prophet goes into the room. He walks up and down and he prays. Nothing happens. The prophet goes. He lies on the boy face to face, nose to nose, eyes to eyes. Nothing happens. The prophet gets up again. He walks around. He goes back and he lies on the boy. And then only the miracle takes place. There were three things that the prophet had to do 
before the miracle could take place. And in the woman's case, she just had to run towards her miracle. She had to run towards her miracle. Now I can ask you today as you're listening or as you're watching, have you stopped running towards your miracle? Has things happened in life that have put you in almost a suspense-like state where you are suspended between nowhere and somewhere and you are not doing anything? You are not pursuing the calling and the purpose that God has for your life because of the blows that life has dealt you. You know, if you've ever taken a run, you will know that running, especially track running and a long distance running, is not easy. It's not easy because the surface that we're running on is different. You get stony surfaces, you get grass, you get mud. Then the heights is different. I mean, you get uphills, you get downhills. The weather is different. You get hot, you get cold. So there's a lot of factors that a, a track runner or a long distance runner needs to consider. There are days when the wind blows and it's blowing towards you and you're running against the wind all the time. There's times when you hit an uphill and when the heat is so bad that it's unbearable. But you must keep running. Keep running. And this is similar for us as we run this race with perseverance. The writer of Hebrew writes in Hebrews 12 verse 1 to 3, And let us run. Let us run. If you really go look at that text, it means that it's up to us to continue to run. There's a lot of things God does for us. He empowers us. He bestows upon us the abilities and the talents that we need. He empowers us and leads us and guides us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reminds us and encourages us. And there's such a lot that the Holy Spirit does for us. But the Holy Spirit cannot keep us running. For us to run, your mind has to tell your legs to move forward. Spiritually speaking, you need to receive this in the Spirit today. Let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. There's also a race marked out. And the problem is that we cannot decide where we're going to run. This is something that we miss when we read Hebrews 12 verse 1. We don't always see that. But we cannot decide where we're going to run. Unfortunately, we can take precautions. We can prepare ourselves. We can be better athletes. We can strengthen ourselves in the Lord. We can have faith. We can build ourselves up in our most holy faith. We can prepare ourselves functioning in the gifts of the Spirit as we've spoken before and being equipped with the armor of God. We can do all of those things, but we cannot determine where we're going to run. There are things that we go through as Christians that we don't want to go through. I'll never forget when I was a runner, there were certain routes that I would avoid because I knew that those routes were difficult. Here in George, there's a place called Comfort Drift. And it's one of the steepest little uphills you will ever find. And I remember myself running around Comfort Drift all the time. And that is a lot of times how we try and manage our spiritual lives. We try and focus on avoiding what is inevitable. What we have to face, what we have to go through. We're not talking about submitting ourselves to demonic authority or submitting under demonic power. No, we are children of God, sons of God with authority. We're not talking about that. But we are talking about doing life. You know what I'm talking about. There are times when you are facing things in your life that you don't want to face. There are times that you're going through things that you don't want to go through. And as you're running today, you might be running a hill. It might be a hill of financial problems. It might be a medical hill of facing certain fights in your body. It might be a psychological hill of psychology and psychological problems and issues. Depression maybe. Maybe you're facing depression. Maybe you're suffering from anxiety attacks. Maybe in the church everybody's just said to you, get over it and get on with it. 
but you are suffering wherever you are listening from or watching from today. You are suffering. But Hebrews says, let us run this race that is marked out with us with perseverance. And then the author says to us, how to overcome the hills, how to overcome the difficulty, how to overcome the wind blowing in your face or the sun burning down on you. How do you overcome this? How do you continue to run when you feel you cannot run anymore? How do you carry on when you feel you want to give up right now? I've been there before many times. I've wanted to close my business. I've wanted to give up on ministry. I've been in the hill of despair or on the, in the valley of despair, running on the hill of despair so many times that I cannot tell you how many times I've been there. Where I thought to myself, I don't even want to live anymore. I don't even want to carry on anymore. We all get there. I was listening to a preacher talking last night, uh, Jensen Franklin, which has this showcase ministry, this huge church. He was weeping, telling of the things that he's gone through, the hills that he's run, the times that he wanted to give up, the times when he felt he couldn't carry on anymore. You see him on TV preaching, you see the church filling up, you see all the glory and all the power in the television ministry and flying all over the world. And this man is crying and weeping. He wants to give up because he's running a race. And this race is marked out for him. He didn't expect that his daughter was going to go into the world and give them a hard time. He didn't expect that problems would hit his family. Oral Roberts, one of the greatest men of God who held healing crusades all over America, he didn't expect that his son would end up being a drug addict and dying. Rick Warner, who wrote the book Purpose Driven Life, he didn't expect that his son would take his own life and one day he and his wife got home and this author of Purpose Driven Life, this New York best-selling author, this guy who was celebrated all over the Christian community, he had to deal with a dead son. How do you continue to run when life happens? How do you continue to run when the hills are just getting steeper and steeper? How do you continue to run when you feel that there's no fiber of energy left in your body, you cannot do it anymore. How do you continue to run today? Listen, how do you continue to run when you're on drugs or your children's on drugs or your husband's an alcoholic or you are suffering? How do you continue to run when you're fighting cancer in your body and the doctors told you that you're dying? How do you continue to run? How do you continue to run with this race marked out for you with perseverance? How? The writer of Hebrew tells us how. This sounds simple, but let me tell you it's not simple. It is fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's fixing our eyes on Jesus. When you're running, you're tempted to look at the length and the height of the hill. You're tempted to look at the distance that you still have to run. You're tempted to look at your surroundings and the circumstances. But the Holy Spirit, as the author of the book of Hebrews, tells you today, fix your eyes. So what's wrong with your eyes today? What's wrong with your eyes if you turned your eyes to the storm like Peter? He was looking at the wind and looking at the waves and he started going down. Where are your eyes today? What are you looking at? Listen, there's going to be times when you feel you can't. There's going to be times when you feel you just can't carry on anymore. There's going to be times when you feel you're going to give up. There's going to be times when you lose vision for, for years sometimes in your life. Where you feel nothing's happening in your church, nothing's happening in your business, nothing's happening in your workplace, all your dreams have turned into nightmares. There's going to be those times when you get to the end of broken dreams. There's going to be those times. But the writer of Hebrews tells us one thing to do. 
and one thing only to do because it's from that one thing that all other things flow. If you fix your eyes today, it means recommitting your life to Christ for some. It means realigning yourself with Christ's purpose for others. It means returning to sensitivity of the Spirit for others, those who have lost connection with the head who cannot hear anymore. For others, it means taking some serious repentance decisions and turning away from a lifestyle that you're living and things that you've entangled yourself in that you're not supposed to be. Some of you are prodigals sitting in the pig's den this morning. Others are just Jonas sitting in the fish's belly. There are many different people with many different situations listening today and watching today, but the same message remains stern and concrete for all of us. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, not today, now, if you hear His voice. Do not harden your heart. Yes, you might have done it. A week ago. You might have done it a year ago. Years ago. There's no time such as now. And it is now time. It says Jesus for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. He endured the cross. He went to that cross with joy. How did he do that? Because he knew. What the divine purpose was upon his life. And as you fix your eyes upon Jesus, He will reveal the divine purpose for your life. And as the divine purpose is revealed in your life, you will be able to persevere. Listen, it's that purpose, the godly purpose, that brings the perseverance. Viktor Frankl in the prisons, the concentration camps, Corrie ten Boom in the concentration camps, you listen to their stories, you read their autobiographies, how their families were killed before their eyes, how they suffered, how they came out of those concentration camps where everybody around them had been killed, all their assets had been taken, they'd been reduced to zero, and they held on to divine purpose, to Jesus. To Jesus. It's the only author the only perfecter, the only writer of your story today. Yes, having money is okay. Having assets is okay. Having a title is okay. Having positions is okay. Having cars and houses and wives and husbands and all of those things, it's all okay. But there's one author and there's one perfecter. Come back today. This is probably why I've come to radio. Not just to encourage you, but to call you back to the center. To call you back to a position where you make first things first. Jesus. The author and the perfecter of your faith. Jesus. The center. Jesus. Number one. Jesus. 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 You speak Jesus over everything in your life. You declare Jesus over everything in your life and you enter into that divine intimate relationship. Not a religion, a divine intimate relationship. And that takes you from glory to glory. That makes you run up these hills with joy and gladness. That takes you into a position of victory. I want to end off with a promise. We all need a promise, especially when we face a problem. We need a promise. You're facing a problem today. You're facing something today. Something's happening in your life. I don't know what, but the Holy Spirit sent me here to tell you that you are facing something today and you need to fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. That is fixing your life. That is aligning your life with the Creator's divine intent. Listen, if you're a pot, you will be you were created to be a pot. If you're trying to be a kettle, if you're trying to be a toaster, if you're trying to be a spoon, if you're trying to be something else, you're a misfit in terms of what you're supposed to do. And when we try and face life on our own, when we try to make our own decisions, we find that we are misfits. We don't fit in because we're not where we're supposed to be. The prodigal son was not supposed to be in the bars and the clubs and in the pig's den. He was supposed to be in his father's house. 
sitting with the staff, sitting with the shoes on his feet and sitting with the garment. He was supposed to be in a position of authority, in a position of power and jurisdiction, and yet he ended up being in a position of abuse because he missed the point of fixing his eyes so that Jesus could lead him by his spirit into his divine purpose. So this is the promise I'm leaving you with today. Isaiah 43 verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, He who formed you. This is the Creator speaking. He formed you, He created you. He says, Do not fear, for I have summoned you by name. Do not fear, for I have summoned you by name. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Listen, He's with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And even when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. You might be in the river this morning. You might be in the waters this morning. You might be in the fire this morning. The promise is the same. Lo, I'm with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. In Jesus' name, amen.